Good morning. It is Monday morning, September 13th on a beautiful, almost fall day here. I'm Mayor Chris Jensen joining you once again for another edition of Mental Health Monday this morning. Thank you so much for those who are tuning in. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. I was just telling my good friend Kristen Boyce that on my water bottle is a ladybug. So I've got to read that as to that it's going to be a great week for me, Kristen. Don't you agree? I think it's good luck. I do. I think it's good luck too. Good so things are we'll, coming your way. Good things are happening here. So um, appreciate y'all joining. I'm joined once again by my good friend, someone who's given just countless uh, hours actually of her time to this community, Kristen Boyce, the owner of Pathways to Healing Council. Good morning, Kristen. Good morning, Mayor Jensen. I just absolutely look forward to our time together every other week. Yes, I uh, appreciate you um, always, again, just giving of your time, uh, volunteering to do this and, and start this conversation with us. I, I want to start out by saying, you know, we kind of always give a preview on social media as to what we're going to talk about today. Today's a really heavy topic, um, but if, if anyone knows me personally knows that I don't shy away from anything. Um, the whole point of this conversation on Mental Health Monday is to dive into maybe some uncomfortable topics and, and some bold topics. And so uh, September is Suicide Prevention Month. Um, across the country. And so we want to dive into that conversation a little bit around suicide. So I want folks to know that we're going to cover that today. We're going to talk openly about it. Um, there, you know, obviously with the pandemic and in just life in general, there's, there's, um, there's, there can be a lot of talk around this topic and, and we need to address it head on. Chris and I can tell you, I was thinking about this a minute ago. One of the reasons that really um, elevated this conversation around mental health for me was back at the beginning of the pandemic at the end of March of 2020, I was looking at statistics in terms of COVID-19. And the, one of the most shocking things, and I tell this all the time, was that we had had a point in time where more people had died in Noblesville because of suicide in a week than had died of COVID-19. Um, and that was what really opened my eyes and, and, and convinced me that we need to have an honest conversation around that. So we're going to have an honest conversation today. We want you to know that, um, you know, please address that the way you need to address that today with us. We hope that you'll stay on and listen and, and join us. But we respect those who um, who need to, to, to work through that. And hopefully we can give some good resources around that here today. So um, that was my little precursor to this conversation. Let's get started the way we always love to get started. I was just doing it on State Road 32 on my way in, Kristen as I passed your office, actually, some square breathing. So I'll let you lead us through that exercise. Yeah, the first thing as we talk about this hard conversation is we're gonna go back to our breath to regulate us, to help us calm down, to self-soothe. So this is the first thing I teach clients and we've done this every single time we've been together um, to really equip people to know how to handle hard emotions that come up, hard challenges and stress and overwhelm in our lives. So this is the first thing I want people to practice and I invite you to practice each and every day, every hour is to reprogram your body, so to speak, to default to taking a breath rather than reacting. So we're gonna put our feet on the floor and we're gonna inhale through our nose for four, we're gonna hold for four and we're gonna release slowly out our mouth for eight. It's almost like you're cooling a cookie. I do this with kids or you're kind of blowing through a straw because we want that slow exhale to calm the nervous system down and come back to center. So let's do it together. We're gonna to do two breaths, kind of get comfortable in your chair or if you're standing, pressing into your feet. And let's do our inhale through our nose. We're holding and release slowly out your mouth. Just kind of check into your nervous system. And just notice how you feel. We're gonna do one more together, pressing into your feet, a big belly breath, big inhale. And release. This is a way to come back to a calm place. And it's when you practice this on a regular basis, then when you're triggered by something, your brain can go, oh, first thing I need to do is breathe. It's like step one is breathe. After you're aware you're triggered, then start your breathing. 
Yep. And I will, I will start by saying too, not only is this important for you as an individual, but I have started to institute that. Um, I actually spoke at a great Nobles on mainstream event with some downtown business owners a few weeks ago. Before I started, I had everybody close their eyes because sometimes people are more comfortable with that in a group setting. I get that. And we did some square breathing. And so that was, if you're, if you're a, a leader of any kind, whether it be a pastor in a church or a leader of an organization, feel free to incorporate that. Um, it, you know, like I said, and have folks close their eyes if they're more comfortable. That's fine too, um, to do it. But it was a great way to start the meeting and got everybody kind of centered and and understanding going forward. So appreciate your uh, your guiding us in that. Again, if you have any questions today, if you have any comments, if you want to say hi, feel free to always enter those in the chat. If we don't get to it during our uh, show today, we'll we'll follow up with you and get back to you. Um, but feel free to that that chat is there for you to utilize going forward. And obviously, on the topic of suicide today. Um, if there are some folks that are sitting there that think, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, that doesn't concern me. It's not something that I'm personally dealing with. That's great. But maybe there's somebody else that you might run into some point. So stick with us, learn a little bit about it, use this as an educational opportunity, and we can hopefully equip you with some resources going forward to maybe not only save your life, but maybe save, save some others going forward. So let's dive into that, Kristen. Um, why don't you talk us a little bit about um, really the, the I'll let you kind of lead the conversation as the expert around this topic here this morning um, and around suicide and suicide prevention and coping strategies. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is we're seeing an uptick with youth in particular in this area. And let me say one thing very quickly about suicide. People don't want to be in pain. They don't want to be in emotional pain. They don't want to be in physical pain and they don't know a way out of it. They feel trapped. They feel hopeless and they are struggling with their own thoughts in and of itself. So if you've ever struggled with this, I want to just acknowledge and send you so much love and compassion because we can go into shame and shame says something's wrong with me. I'm defective. I'm not good enough. And that can take us into the dark abyss. It can take us into what Dr. Brene Brown says is a shame spiral and it causes us to want to hide and isolate and withdraw. And those are really early warning signs, not only for yourself, but for other people. So if you're starting to really not want to be around other people, and this can be kind of normal too. So we're going into, if this is pervasive and you are really struggling with kind of functioning, getting out of bed, really your thoughts are consumed by not wanting to be here. Maybe you feel like a burden. This is often what I hear people say, I don't want to feel like a burden. People will be better off without me because the pain is taking over the thoughts. And then when the thoughts are taking over, then the emotions of shame and guilt and anxiety and depression take over and they don't know how to work through it. And so, cause we weren't taught this, we weren't taught how to nurture our emotions. We weren't taught how to process pain. We weren't taught even to acknowledge our grief and our fears and our sadness and anger and disgust. We were never equipped to handle these emotions. And so we don't know what to do with the pain. And the first thing I want to say is it feels lonely and you feel like, what, how do I even get out of this dark hole? I don't see any out. And so when we can start learning how to name the emotions, hold space for them, have some self-compassion, that takes us out of this hopelessness and into the doorway of possibility. Now, does it happen overnight? No. So the second thing I want to say is support is essential. We all want to feel seen and known and understood and loved and cared for. And we don't want to put this on someone else. So we tend to hide it and not say anything. And one of the greatest gifts that we can offer someone else is to say, hey, I noticed you seem like something might be bothering you. Is everything okay? What's going on? And use that noticing somebody and acknowledge them. This is one of the things we will hear repeatedly from suicide survivors and thrivers that go on to find healing. They'll say, somebody asked me if I was okay. One person asked me if I was okay, and that started shifting things for me. And so when we can invite ourselves to check in with other people, and right now it's more crucial than ever ever before to check in with somebody say hey i care about you i haven't talked to you in a while how are you feeling how are you doing is everything okay because what we want to do is if they go yeah everything's fine we talked about last week fine means feelings inside not expressed good Boom. 
feelings inside not expressed, I'm going to go, no, I really want to know how you're doing. What's really going on? And you're then going to acknowledge and hold space and listen to what they say. You're not going to try to make them feel better because then they feel like, ooh, that didn't feel good. And now they want to move away and repress and go back into hiding. But if you go, oh, yeah, this has been such a hard time and it's been so filled with grief and loneliness and loss, that makes sense. You feel that way. Tell me more about it. Tell me more about it. And you listen. You don't try to get jump in there and go, well, you know, it's not that bad. Well, I had a friend that had that same thing and this is what they did. Don't try to fix, fix it. Let them process it. And this is one of the most important things when you are holding space for somebody. And, and the other piece is we don't ask someone if they're suicidal. And I want to equip everybody to be able to say, do you feel suicidal? And people are like, ooh, I don't want to plant a seed. Like, oh, maybe they weren't suicidal and now they feel suicidal. You can't. You're not going to make them. You're not going to plant a seed. It's already there. You're actually getting them to process it and name it and tend to it. And so when you say, are you feeling suicidal? And they say, yeah, I'm having suicidal thoughts. Now, a lot of people don't want to say that out loud. If you say, are you feeling like you don't want to be here anymore? And they say, yeah, I am. And you say, do you have a plan? Now, these are questions. These are three questions I'm going to teach you. Do you have a plan? And they say, yeah, I've kind of thought about a plan. Do you have means? Like, have you thought about how you would do that? Yeah, I kind of have. You're immediately not going to leave the person, okay? You're not going to leave the person. They need support at that moment. You can call 1-800-273-TALK right then and there. You can text 741741 right then and there, and they can walk you through what to do. And oftentimes they'll have them talk to the person and you're going, well, they'll never talk to this person. They'll never be okay with this. I'm like, that that doesn't even matter at this point. This person is crying out for help. You can also call 911 if you need support. And then you can take them to the local um, emergency room, Community North here in Indianapolis. We also have St. Vincent's Stress Center. And you are not going to leave the person alone. You're going to remove weapons, any kind of anything that could, you know, pills, knives, razors, guns, those all go away and you're not leaving the person. They're not being left unattended, unattended and you're getting them support. And you are acknowledging and not shaming them for what they just shared. So if you're like, well, why would you even think that? You're so loved and you have so many friends and you have so much going for you. You don't say any of that. You say, tell me more about it. That must feel really scary. Because guess what? Anybody with suicidal thoughts is scared to death. They are scared of their own thoughts. They're scared of their own emotions. They're scared of what they could do next. They are scared and they feel like this is the only option they have to deal with the pain. So the last thing you want to do is shame them and go, but why? But we've loved you so well, but none of that. If someone, if you see someone start withdrawing, if you see someone starting to give away important items um, that they have once loved and they're just starting to give everything away, that's a red flag. That's a sign. If you see somebody or you have felt that way where you're starting to research ways to hurt yourself, you need to get some help. And again, 1-800-273-TALK. Tell someone that you care about. This is something where we feel like, well, nobody, I don't want to be a burden and nobody really cares about me. And here's what I want to tell you is when you do tell someone, chances are there is a person that does care about you. Even if it's a therapist, even if you call and get a therapy appointment, that's a step in the direction to end your suffering in a healthy way, to tend to that emotional pain, that trauma you might have been carrying for so long, that feeling of neglect you might have been carrying for so long. There is help available. And when I can equip people on how to have these conversations in a most loving, nurturing, caring way, we can break cycles. We can help someone say, okay, you matter. You're important just by your presence, just by you listening, by you asking, by you saying, hey, I'm here for you. And you check in with this person. You check in with them and you say, how are you doing? How's it going? How are you feeling? Let me help plug you in to get you some support. 
go ahead. No, I was just going to, I wanted you to back up for just a minute. Those three questions that you asked, could you repeat them again? I thought those were really important for those the folks to hear again. Yes. Do you feel suicidal? Do you have suicidal thoughts? Ask it. Ask it direct. I cannot, exp I cannot specify that enough. And again, you got to work through your own stuff. If you have fear around this, maybe you have some unprocessed grief and loss. Um, if you do not ask the question, they will not answer you directly because they're going to bl blow right past it because you didn't ask the specific question. And so their pain is going to say, uh -uh, I'm not telling anybody. I'm going to hide that. It's too much. I, I feel hopeless. I feel trapped with it. I don't want anybody to know. So you've got to ask directly. The second thing is, do you have a plan? So do they have a plan to carry this out? And the third thing is, do you have a timeline and do you have means? So you're asking if, if there's a yes to any of those, you're going to then call the 800 number. You're going to go to the emergency room. You're not going to leave the individual. And so that's one of the most important things. I think we get afraid to ask the question. I coach people all the time in this. They're like, oh, I just, I don't think I can ask that. I'm like, this is what I'm telling you is research based because if we don't ask the question, you're not going to get the answer. They're going to tell you what they think you want. They want you to hear what you, they think you want to hear. Yeah. I think that's important. Again, that, that's, it, it's going to involve some folks working through on their own end, how to get themselves to ask that question. You know, that's not a very, as you said, not a very comfortable question to ask somebody, but boy, um, won't you be glad you did if it ultimately turns out, you know, on the other end. So I want to back up you. Um, I think an important question I have from my standpoint is, you know, you talked about, you know, feeling not wanting to get out of bed, sad, withdrawn. A lot of that sounds like depression to me, you know, so can you talk maybe about some differences between the two and maybe key differentiators to kind of help folks identify the differences? Yeah, I think that's a very good point because one of the big differences is if we're looking at self-harm, if you know someone is cutting or you know someone is self-harming in any kind of way because that physical pain almost feels better than the emotional pain. It's almost like a distraction. If there's any kind of cutting, you need to be asking these questions and you need to ask what's going on because underneath that is unprocessed emotions that need a empathic witness. So if there's any kind of self-harm, if there's, so this is a differentiator, self-harm is, is important differentiator and we'll see that often in youth and it's important we're not minimizing that. We're not saying, oh, it's for attention. We are taking action and asking, are you having suicidal thoughts? Do you have means? Do you have a timeline? Do you have a plan? If there's a yes to those, then we need to take action. If there's suicide, if there's self-harm, I absolutely, without a millisecond of hesitation, they need therapy. That means there's unprocessed emotions that need attention, and it's that is immediate sign for therapy. So, I, and you don't want to sweep that under the rug. So that's a that's a telltale sign, and that's a difference between depression and trauma and possibly some suicidal ideation. So that needs to be addressed. We're also looking at um, increased drug or alcohol usage. That is a definite sign that can look like depression, but if they are getting to the point where there's blackouts, they are um, dangerous and risky in their driving behavior and some of their choices, that needs immediate attention. That's something you're not going to sweep under the rug. You're going to get immediate help for them, especially if they're, uh, you know, a teenager or a teen of any sort that needs immediate attention because that often leads to um, not recognizing the line where they cross over a line and it's too late. Um, and sometimes we don't see these signs. And one of the most important things is to do your own work because we can be blocked by our own trauma and our own depression, our own anxiety from seeing who's in front of us to even be able, we could be stuck kind of developmentally in our own trauma. And that can take us to living almost in our past. And that needs to be tended to, that needs to be nurtured and cared for and compassionately dealt with. And so another indicator that's really important is if someone is withdrawing from you in a significant way. And what do I mean by that? That means they are completely disengaging from consistent conversation. They're disengaging from 
um, friendships, they're disengaging from their normal routines. They're disengaging from their normal routines. That is a red flag that needs attention and you're gonna ask, are you having suicidal thoughts? This is something again, we're scared of. And the more I can equip you to say, th ask the question, the more you're gonna be able to get an answer. It doesn't mean they're always gonna tell you the truth. It means that you're actually showing them you care. And your tone of voice, your body language, if you come at it with a very shaming tone, chances are they're not gonna feel safe with you. If you come at it in a very um, accusatory tone, threatening tone, disgusted, angry, they're probably not going to feel safe with you. So it takes, that's why the breath at the very beginning, take your deep breath, say a prayer, whatever works for you to be able to have the words and the compassion and the empathy to meet this person's pain. The difference here is we are addressing pain. And I think with depression, you're addressing pain. With suicidal ideation, you're addressing pain. This is the theme that we've been working on throughout our time together doing Mental Health Mondays is we are no longer shoving pain under the rug. We're no longer trying, we're, we're calling it to light. We're saying, it's okay, we all have pain. We've never been taught how to deal with it. There's nothing wrong with you. It's what's happened to you or what may be going on in your thoughts that need to, in your emotions, that in your body that needs a process. It needs to be tended to. And that's what we're talking about here with suicide prevention. We are talking about metabolizing, processing, and acknowledging pain, whether it's emotional or physical. So I want to pivot. Uh, my good friend, Lindsay Bennett, asked a good question. Um, actually, she just made a good statement as a parent. Um, you know, walk us through it. If, you know, if, if we're not dealing with this, maybe in our own individual life, or you know, we talked a lot about adult to adult conversations. I imagine it's a little bit different when you're dealing with a teenager or even younger than that. I'm sure you're seeing that in your practice, Kristen, um, even younger than that. So can you walk through a little bit about how to address this in the next generation? Yeah. The first thing is taking a deep breath, mm -hmm. coming at it with because your fear can take over, right? You're noticing maybe some behavior changes. Maybe you're just scared in general from kind of just society and what's been going on. The first thing is take a deep breath and pay attention. Be attuned to your kid. Notice, talk to your kid about what they like to talk about. I'm telling you, these are some prevention things. So if they want to talk about Pokemon, I'm making this up, but, and they love Pokemon. You're going to talk about Pokemon. You're going to ask them questions about Pokemon. Be interested in what they're interested in. Be curious about what they like, what they don't like. Ask them, how are you feeling? I can imagine school's hard and friendships. I know that's so hard and we can feel like we don't belong. What's going on for you? How are you feeling? If you suspect any kind of suicidal thought, you're going to go again direct. Are you, do you have any suicidal thoughts? Do you have any feelings of not wanting to be here? Do you feel like the world would be a better place without you? Do you feel like you're a burden to us? I mean, these are questions that we don't ask our kids. If you're suspecting any kind of suicidal ideation, I need you to ask those questions. And I need you to hold space when they tell you the answer, you're acknowledging it. So it looks like they say, yeah, I feel like I'm a burden. You can go, oh, that must be so painful. Tell me more about that. And you're not going to go, well, you're not a burden and you, I love you so much. That comes later. The first thing is let them get it out. Let them process that emotion. Let them process those negative beliefs and fears that they have that no one cares about them and they're causing everyone else anguish. So, or maybe they feel super rejected at school and like nobody likes them and they're a loner and nobody cares about them. And you're going to process that or you're going to take them to therapy and process that. And what I say about therapy, because teens are like, I'm not, go some teens are like, yes, sign me up. And other teens are like, I am not doing that. When I say to parents, I kind of say to them, here's how to have the conversation. You're not going to tell us everything and that's healthy and that's okay. You don't have to tell us everything. It's important. You have somebody to process the pain with 
to process the shame with and the fear you might have so you don't feel so alone and like you're a burden to us and that you you can work through and tend to what's really going on for you. It's kind of like having somebody that you can talk to and then they can help you through it. And we don't have to. Now, I recommend parents also have their own therapy because it's important the parents have support. So I, it's just not the kid. The parents need to also be in therapy. So what I recommend is the parents are like, we're going we're going to have our own therapist. We're going to do our own therapy because we need it too. We realize there's some things we need to work on in terms of listening to your emotions or maybe not being so reactive or calming down and not yelling. Like we have our own work to do too. So we're going. <sighs> We're not just signing our kids up for therapy. We need to be going to therapy too. And this is kind of one of those things where people are like, well, I don't need it. I'm like, we all need support. Mm -hmm. Here's the truth. We all need support. Maybe you and need to call it something different, but you need it. You need it. We all do. We, a life coach. Yeah. Cause if we don't, if we feel so alone and we're lost on how to handle it with our kids, we need that support. And that's the beautiful thing. Whether it's a life coach, a therapist, whatever you need mm -hmm. to help you through it is so important. Groups are great. Support groups are wonderful. And so I think if we can start naming the pain, that's the conversation. And we can acknowledge it and we can hold space for it without trying to fix, rescue, or save the pain. Let them process it. We're going to make headway here. I think the saving the space is one of the hardest things I, as a parent, I catch myself all the time now with when my son gets down on something with one of my kids and I, I instantly want to, Oh no, you're not. Or no, no, you're not bad. Or, you know, no, you didn't play horrible baseball last night, you know? And I'm like, wait, just and I back myself into it. I'm like, yeah, tell me more about that. You know, or, or what, what, how that make you feel? Or, you know, but your instant reaction as a parent is to not hold that space is to go in and fill that space and quickly try to solve that space for your kid. And, and the saving the space, I think Kristen is exactly one of the challenges we have, you know, be prepared to listen to the answer and listen. And I, I am guilty as charged as a parent, as a mayor, as everything, you know, working on listening is one of my biggest challenges. Yeah. I think it is for all of us. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk quickly with the time we have left here on some coping strategies um, and some, and some practical things that we can implore um, going forward on this topic. First thing is breathing where we already crossed that off the list. The second thing is leaning in to hard emotions. I cannot emphasize this enough. The third thing is name it. If you have any fear around it, ask the specific question. I cannot empower you enough. And I know it's scary. And I know you're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to plant seeds. You're not going to plant any seeds. You're going to talk about the pain. You're going to talk about the elephant in the room. We're no longer in a place where we can just bypass what's really going on. We need to name it like we are on Mental Health Monday. We're naming hard stuff. We're leaning into it. We're building awareness. We're talking about it. Get support. I can't emphasize that enough. Support is, is so important. And again, 1-800-273-TALK or text 741-741. They are free. Free. So if you're in a situation and you have no idea what to do, it's okay. Text or call the number. And if you're with somebody and you don't know what to do, let's say you're feeling like I I'm, could hurt, hurt myself, call the number. It's okay to ask for help. We're not given permission slips to ask for help. And this is the first thing I want to say. It's okay to ask for help. We all need help at the end of the day. And the last thing I want to say is when we can work on not shaming ourselves, which means saying, what's wrong with you? You're an idiot. You're stupid. Oh, why'd you say that? And then we can work on not leading with shame with other people. I cannot tell you how transformative it is, not only for parenting, just an in interaction with your partner or a friendship or a coworker to go, tell me what's going on. Tell me how you're feeling. And then you acknowledging your own feelings is super important. So those are the highlights. We could deconstruct this topic so much more, but I just wanted to emphasize, don't lean away, lean in. Yeah, lean in. And that, that's what we did today. So Kristen Boyce, uh, you're awesome. We're going to keep leaning in on, on tough conversations. Kristen, you went over throughout that, the show, some good resources. Um, you know, any, any last tidbits if somebody needs help right now? I know you went over some numbers already, but did we miss any? Yeah, I think that's that's the main. Those are the main tidbits in terms yeah. of um, 
help. If yeah. you're the LGBTQ, so there is a number to call because I know right now we're seeing a lot of needed help there. It's 866-488-7586. So that's, a, that's another line for suicide prevention. That's great. Well, thank you guys so much, Kristen. Thanks for leaning in with me on this. Thanks to all of you who participated, who commented. Um, yeah, hopefully this helped maybe open your eyes. Um, if it's not you, watch out for others. Be, be prepared to ask the tough questions. Lean in with us. You, are, you matter, you are loved, and we'll see you back here in two weeks. Thanks again, Kristen. Thank you.